to give you all the floor. But hello, everyone who is here. Uh, my name is Casey Creole, the Executive Director for Diversity and Diabetes. And I'm so excited for this third day of the summit and this session. I have with me Cindy and Allison, um, who are going to be talking about, I love y'all's title. It's Boba Less Sweet Please, um, Navigating Type 1 Diabetes as an Asian American. And um, so I'm just going to hand it off to y'all and let y'all share y'all screen and get going. So, so nice to have y'all with us today. Thank you, Casey. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I think it'll be this window. Can everyone see that? Yeah, good on my end. Awesome. So thank you all for attending our talk. Um, Boba less sweet, please. That refers to usually how we modify or, or order if we um, get some milk tea out in the wild. <laughs> As type 1 diabetics, we try to make our drinks less sweet. And boba is super, super popular in the Asian American community. Um, so again, my name is Allison Ong, and we have uh, Cindy Chen as my lovely co-host. So uh, we wanted to start off with some introductions of ourselves. So uh, my name, Allison, I'm a third year medical student at UC Davis in Sacramento, California. I was diagnosed when I was 11, so it's been about 14 years. Um, these are my devices that I use. I'm on the tandem Dexcom combo, absolutely loving it. Um, I also did some diabetes research during college when I went to UCLA, um, and that was pretty meaningful towards me and sort of kind of combining STEM and diabetes. Um, I've also been um, involved with um, diabetes kind of organizational volunteering. I really like, you know, diabetes camps and uh, being able to spend time with the youth. So <laughs> Camp Wanakira in San Diego uh, was a really, really fun way to like kind of um, be a camp counselor for diabetic kids. And, and actually Cindy shares this in common too, this exact same camp. Um, I'm also been in tangentially involved in California's Insulin for All chapter, helping to make some in infographics and following their other projects in insulin accessibility, which is so important. Um, some of my goals in the future are to like pursue pediatrics, more specifically adolescent medicine, and just continuing to learn about inclusive care for diabetes and be able to put this into practice. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy Chen. I'm currently a second year physician assistant student in Virginia. I'm originally from Southern California. That's how Allison and I know each other because we went to first met each other in middle, middle school. Uh, I was diagnosed when I was seven years old and I've been living with type one for about 18 years now. Um, I also, you know, I've been involved in JDRF. Uh, Allison and I actually um, made a team together for the Walk to Cure Diabetes, or now it's called the One Walk. Um, and so that's been something really close to my heart. I've been involved with Children's Congress in the past. And then like Allison, I've also really enjoyed diabetes camp. I've actually never been as a camper, but I got to go as a counselor, which is the picture that you see here. And I enjoyed it so much, just getting to see all the kids kind of, you know, run around, like, you know, just be normal kids and just have normal conversations of like, oh, what kind of pump do you have? Oh, that's the pump you have. Oh, okay, how many times do you test? And just like stuff like that, and just being able to relate to each other. So I think that's so, so important and something that's um, really close to my heart. All right, so let's go into the outline. So um, this is basically what we're gonna be talking about in this presentation. So Allison and I have both introduced ourselves. Uh, so let's get started with part one. So part one is diagnosis, childhood, and growing up as a diabetic. So right here, we have a breakdown of diabetes by ethnicity in the United States. And as you can see here, um, the largest, the majority tends to be American Indian slash Alaskan natives, as well as non, uh, as well as Hispanics. So Asian Americans are the second lowest group here. And so we do have it, but we do tend to find the minor we do tend to fall in the minority when it does come to diabetes in the United States. Next slide. And again, with this chart here, you can kind of see us still following that trend. So in all of the columns, when you look at the race and ethnicity in the bottom, um, we are still following in, we are the lowest category. So it, with diagnosed diabetes in terms of in the millions, we're the lowest at 1.6 million. This is from 2018. 
Uh, also undiagnosed diabetes numbers, again, were still the lowest at 0.7 and total number of diabetes in the millions were again fall below us in 2.3 in the United States. So going more specifically into the statistics of diabetes in kids, um, these, this is data from 2011 to 2015 showing that Asian and Pacific Islander children and youth had the largest significant increases in type 1. So type 1 is on uh, this left side and our combined Asian Pacific Islander statistic is represented by this dark blue line. And you can kind of see that gradual uptick over here. Um, and we, when we say incidents, we mean new diagnoses. Um, so what explains this? Asians are genetically like less likely to get type one. Um, so there may be many factors contributing to these rates. Um, either way, it seems that cases of T1D have been increasing for our Asian and over here for our black population. So we need more thoughts and more research on the why and how, and it'll be interesting to see these trends moving forward. Of course, more T1D diagnosis in childhood means more T1D adults, right? So um, it will fill, these changes will filter down. Also on this right side, um, the type two diabetes graph, I really appreciate when studies differentiate type one versus type two, right? Because these are really two very different diseases. Um, I just wanted to point out here um, that among, among children, the, um, the rate of uh, diagnoses in, of type two in white children has remained relatively stable. Whereas for all our considered minority or minoritized groups, these rates have been rising. And there are a lot of you know, the socioeconomic factors, um, health factors, intergenerational trauma factors that have contributed to this rise. So I um, wanted to point this out. Um, some other in interesting facts about um, Asian American kids with diabetes. There's not, there's a whole not a lot of literature on this, um, but Asians ha have the highest rates of overweight and obesity in, in some of these um, areas studied. Okay, and some more statistics to throw at you. Uh, I thought this one was, um, the first bullet point was super, super interesting. Uh, around 50% of diabetes cases in Asian Americans are undiagnosed, which is higher than any other ethnic or racial group. And later in this talk, we'll talk about the barriers to um, achieving care for um, especially our Asian populations with language barriers and what other barriers that exist. Um, other things we found, half of the Asian American adults in New York City have diabetes and prediabetes. That's a lot, that's one in two people. Um, and Asian Americans are 40% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. Um, and some of the reasons behind this is that Asians have um, a higher uh, body fat percentage. So if you have a white person with a BMI of 27 and an Asian person with a BMI of 27, um, the Asian person genetically predisposed to have a higher uh, body fat, especially collecting around the abdomen, around the middle. And when you have abdominal fat like that, it increases your risk for type two diabetes, something called metabolic syndrome. So I thought that was super interesting that just due to our like body habitus, um, the Asian population can be at a higher risk of getting type two. Um, also smoking is super big in, in Asian countries. Back in China, I think one in three people uh, or one in three adults um, are smokers and smoking is, is really affiliated with um, an inflammatory state and a whole bunch of chronic illnesses, including diabetes. Um, so I wanted to just sh share a few slides about growing up Asian and diabetic, and then I'll also hand Cindy the mic so she can input as well. Um, so for me, uh, we both grew up in Southern California. Um, wonder if anyone's been involved with JDRF Youth Ambassadors. Basically, you sign up and you're sort of involved as a volunteer for JDRF. You show up to these events. This is like the JDRF Gala, which is a big fundraiser in, the or in Orange County. Um, and there were other orgs we were involved with. Um, so these experiences are near and dear to my heart. But in many of these photos from my childhood, I could tell it was the only, one of the only Asians in the room, usually. And it didn't really bother me when I was young, right? Like I was, you know, I made friends, it was great. Um, but as I got older, my circle of close friends in middle school and high school were included very amazing Asian girls and guys who just 
ended up that way. Like a lot of my friends were Asian. And then when I started to sort of build those lasting friendships, I would notice when I took time on the weekend to go to something diabetes related, I would just notice that difference in demographic shift. Um, I never had any racist comments or microaggressions that I remember um, were told to me. But, you know, as I got older, as I got into my teenage years, um, I have felt the difference there, especially if I went to camp. Um, sometimes I just realized, oh, like this thing that I can talk about with my Asian friends, something related to family dynamics or entertainment or food or culture, I couldn't easily, or I could bring it up, but I couldn't relate to others on, on these ways. So um, I might become aware that these topics, some of these other kids might not be familiar with. It just, just happens when you're the minority. And this is a picture from camp. Um, camp Conrad Chinek is, is where I went for about four summers. It was so much fun. Um, but each session had like 100 to 120 campers and sometimes 50 staff. And the most diabetic, or the most Asians I remember at one of these sessions was like three, like me and an Asian kid and then an, another half Asian camper. So um, again, like the statistics of, of Asians and diabetes would show themselves when I went to these events. Um, I did feel that these things, um, like being Asian in these spaces made me unique, but it was also it could be like lonely to a degree if I considered you know, things that I couldn't relate to others about. Um, Cindy, any other additional um, thoughts about growing up? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's why I was so grateful to have met Allison because she was Asian and also a type one diabetic as well, being able to kind of, you know, bond over that, being able to bond over, you know, having parents who are Asian and, you know, also that kind of struggle as well too. And being the only minority in a room of, other you know type 1 diabetic like volunteers kind of being like I don't feel like I'm at place here um I know we all have the same disease but also at the same time though not being able to relate to them in terms of other struggles that contribute to the nature of our disease so I absolutely related to what Allison was saying okay so let's move on to part two which is eastern cultural practices in healthcare. yes it's also my section so did some fun little research on diabetes and Asian history. These are so many ways to say diabetes in other languages, which was amazing. So Chinese Tang Niao Bing. Uh, my family is Chinese Indonesian. So Kenching Manis is, is our way of saying diabetes. And you can kind of see the similarities uh, between some of these, these languages. Um, from our research, um, one of the earliest ways diabetes was described was in India, 1500 BCE. Um, People with diabetes, when they peed, their urine attracted ants. And so they uh, created this word, madhumeha, not sure if I'm saying it 100% correctly, um, which translates to honey urine. So patients with madhumeha exhibited um, extreme thirst, bad breath, which is what we know with, with DK, and their pee attracted ants. <laughs> um, by the fifth century, Ayurvedic physicians in India had determined there were at least two types of diabetes, one which developed in the young, which turned into type one, and one which was associated with obesity and occurred in adults. Um, and Chinese doctors were also noting around this time that people with diabetes tended to be wealthier, heavier, and were more likely to suffer infections. So um, that could be either type. Um, and so this text, the Yellow Emperor's classic of medicine, um, they named this condition and elaborated on its symptoms. And then we kind of zoom to the present day where we have um, this page I found, the Asian Association for the Study of Diabetes and which lists the diabetes organizations in, in many of these Asian countries. So we've come a long way from saying honey urine to coming up with type one, type two, Lada, Modi, et cetera, et cetera. So I um, thought these were kind of cool to share. All right. All right. So let's, let's talk about the challenges for Asian diabetics. Does this sound weird? No, oh, you sound fine. Okay. All right. So yeah, let's talk about the challenges for Asian diabetics. So the first thing is food which is something I love so, so, so much. Um, it's hard because when we look at like Carb King or a lot of carb counting like websites and sources, they're not really targeted to Eastern culture and Eastern foods that um, Asians typically eat. It's very Eurocentric in terms of dietary recommendations. I know like when I would see my nutritionist or um, like in my endocrinology uh, clinic, like 
they would give recommendations, but none of them were related to what I ate. Like, you know, they didn't understand what I was talking about. Um, for example, I, at least in my uh, Chinese culture, I know the Harvest Moon Festival had happened recently. Actually, my mom had sent over um, some mooncakes. And if the box that it had come in didn't happen to have nutrition facts, I'd have no idea how to give it. Um, so I know at least for me, growing up in an Asian culture, growing up with eating a lot of Asian foods because my parents are immigrants and they cooked a lot of Asian foods, we couldn't really rely on Carp King. It was a lot of growing up and doing a lot of trial and error, being like, oh, okay, if I give this much insulin for you know, rice and other Asian foods that I'm eating uh, and I end up having a high blood sugar, okay, then we're gonna adjust ne next time. You can see right here, there's a picture of dim sum, which I love so, so much. I can tell you it's gonna be really, really hard to find the exact carb carbohydrate count for each of these dishes in dim sum, but it's a lot of trial and out in air, I can tell you, Allison and I have both gotten dim sum, and it's kind of a struggle bus sometimes because there's some really, really good foods here um, that we kind of have to just figure out on our own and do like kind of guessing and checking essentially. Um, but it's a lot of it's um, it's a struggle, but it's something that we have um, kind of learned along the way and learned to kind of adapt. So this is a challenge, but I'd like to think we have kind of risen to it a little bit more um, as time has kind of gone on. Next slide. Oh, sorry, Allison. Yeah, exactly. What Kat says, it's a lot of guessing. It truly is because there's no blatant carb count out there. It's a lot of, okay, this, I'm guessing it's around this much. Um, I can tell you as I've lived with type one longer and longer, um, I, I can now like look at something and be like, okay, I'm gonna give this much insulin. Like, and people will ask, how do you know? I was like, I just know. And that, I feel like that just comes with the experience. Uh, so let's play a little game right here. So let's gonna get well, let's guess how many carbs each of these is. So first, let's guess how much this roti is. You can type in the chat. You can say it out loud. Guess how many carbs the roti is. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of 30s. Wow, I, I guess we're dealing with a bunch of pros because that is exactly the number. I don't even know, clearly we're dealing with pros here, um, but that is exactly right. This one roti about this size is 30 grams. So good job, round of applause, everyone. That was ridiculous, y'all are awesome. Okay, now let's try another one. So 85 degrees medium ice milk tea boba. Now this one is near and dear to me because I actually used to work at 85 degrees for <laughs> summer. Um, so let's give it a go. Let's say 85 degrees, medium ice milk tea boba. We're going to say regular sugar, regular ice. Give it a go. How many, how many carbs do you think this is? 85 grams. <laughs> That's a solid guess. Love it. Okay, so I'm seeing 60, 70, 85, appropriate. Um, so actually, uh, this was 43 grams, which I personally was surprised by too. Um, I was thinking it'd be way more than that, um, but apparently it's 43 grams. So, you know, I, I suddenly don't feel as bad, you know, getting a medium ice milk tea boba, regular sugar, regular ice. <laughs> Of course, all if right. you add all the syrups, if you get like a taro shake or something, mm. like those go like super high, yeah. <laughs> Hmm. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> or Cindy, what I'm, other, when you worked oh. at 85 degrees, what other mm -hmm. things did you bowl us for? I know like breads and pastries are really bread. big. Bread, bread, and it's like bread is so much because it's so heavy too. And oftentimes the bread also had, you know, other stuff with it as well. Like they'd have like some creams, they'd have like, you know, taro and taro is really dense as well. It's kind of like potato, like the root. Yes, the sea salt coffee. I love the sea salt coffee. I It's my favorite drink from 85 degrees. And I, it, I don't feel too bad about that one either because it's not really sweet. It's not too sweet compared to some of their other drinks. So I feel like that's kind of a win, you know, as a type one to get that one. But yes, I would say all their breads were pretty dense and pretty carb heavy, so. So another thing about being Asian is that we oftentimes, I know I oftentimes heard about, oh, these are foods that are good for my type one diabetes that like, you know, oh, like one thing I heard a lot was exactly bitter melon. That's bitter melon on the left and that's pumpkin on the right. I cannot count the number of times my mom has said verbatim, I can quote it now, 
right? <laughs> Bitter melon is good for you. It'll help with your, you know, your type one. She's Tell, my mom has told me stories about like how people with diabetes have just essentially survived on bitter melon. And every single time there's a dish of bitter melon on the dinner table, I would hear that. Um, I would hear that speech and same for pumpkin as well. Uh, that was something that um, my mom had also made a lot as well, be, believing that it, there was some benefit to diabetes, that pumpkin was beneficial. Um, another thing that we had heard, so we had posed this question to the group uh, to a forum that Allison and I are part of, which are which is comprised of Asian diabetics, and they'd also talked about bitter gourd juice. They'd also talked about turmeric, and they'd also talked about cinnamon. And so we had, uh, sorry, Allison, next slide, please. So we had posed the question: Okay, what, um, like you know, in terms of food challenges as an Asian diabetic, what's been a challenge for you? And this person had said having to reduce the amount of rice slash noodles I eat and adjusting. Uh, this person's fruit content away from the tro tropical fruits I grew up eating. So, you know, that's an another struggle, right? That you're so used in your culture, all these things are ingrained into, and food is such a big part of culture and having that part of culture kind of taken away or at least diminished because of their diabetes, um, you know, is absolutely a challenge. Uh, next slide, Allison. And so I found this, I found this a little bit funny. So um, a lot of Asian moms use something called WeChat. And so, especially during quarantine, and then I can also say my mom has used this for a long time that uh, it almost feels like she has a degree from WeChat University, basically that she, you know, she knows all about medicine. She knows what's right for my diabetes and I guess all other stuff. So I found that a little bit funny. All right, next slide, Allison. Yeah, on that note, like my, uh, my grandparents use WhatsApp. <laughs> which is a different app for communicating over overseas as well but yeah I've gotten like chain emails of like this is the way you cure diabetes I've had I've met people like family friends who would sometimes like come up to me with a printout of an article from the internet saying like hey look um bitter it was bitter melon I think here are the benefits of bitter melon diabetes and I was like cool um <laughs> moving on you know <laughs> I mean, I'm not, not, we'll talk about it later. I'm not knocking like, like Eastern herbal remedies or medicines, but it's just kind of funny um, how people like Asian, um, like adults, elders, especially love to share this info and just, it just like, it's like the one and only magic pill. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on to part three, which is talking about Eastern cultural values and diabetes identity. So let's talk about perception of um, diabetes in Asian families. So this is a list of kind of um, things we value in Asian families. And by no means is this a universal list, but I, I do agree that a lot of these things are, um, you know, topics that we hold in high regard. So for example, is community, interdependency and harmony. I know, um, at least in my family, it's really important to always kind of get together, to be able to kind of share with one another, always update each other on, you know, how the kids are doing, you know, how the families are doing, how the grandparents are doing. Um, and also Allison and I are both the children of immigrants. We are both first generation Americans. And so it's kind of balancing that that balancing cultural pride and assimilation because, you know, I am an American citizen. I was born here in the United States uh, and my parents are immigrants. They're Chinese immigrants. And so kind of balancing, okay, I am an American, but I am also from Chinese immigrants and kind of putting it all together and seeing kind of what my identity is. Another important thing is respect to elders. I, you know, we are very um, deferential to our elders, to, um, to our grandparents, to our great grandparents, just because they have so much more life experience than us, they have so much more wisdom than us. And so just being very respectful to, to them. Another thing is uh, academics and prof um, our professional careers. That's something we take a lot of pride in is excelling it. Um, the, this, this, um, often the stigma is there are only three careers you can have as an Asian, a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And so those are almost the only three careers we apparently can have as um, Asian children. And so we pride ourselves in that, that, you know, we tend to pick very successful careers and be um, very ex and excel in them. And along with having those successful careers, there's a lot of financial security in that as well. And so that's something we hold a lot of pride in is that um, that we do, you know, exceed, uh, succeed in a lot of different ways and that we're also because of that, we don't really need to depend on others, um, at least when it comes to finances and stuff like that. Another thing is modesty. You know, I, I know at least my parents are tend to be more on the conservative end, um, and that's something and that comes to uh, attire as well. 
And then also parenting styles. I don't know if anyone has heard of the phrase tiger mom. Um, I know that had come into, uh, had been in the news after like there was a, a rather famous tiger mom who had kind of talked about the authoritarian like parenting style that she had um, basically where it's like always you know you have to do piano you have to learn this right like basically all these things that you have to do um, to kind of please your parents um, I don't really have a tiger mom I had more of a dragon dad I would say um, but I definitely had very uh, strict parents so uh, that was something you know I had to deal with as a you know daughter of Asian immigrants. So we had also asked the question, how is diabetes perceived in the Asian family? And so uh, the group that Allison and I are part of, um, we had posed this question and Julian, who has type one from the UK had said, my parents had very different ideas of how to treat diabetes, often incorrect, and didn't understand how serious it was. It is an almost daily battle to change their cultural perceptions and to persuade them of the lifestyle changes and special equipment or products I need and having to justify the cost of this. So, you know, Allison and I are talking about our struggles as Asian Americans, but even across the pond, you know, th there's also different struggles that they have to deal with as well, you know, as being an Asian um, in other countries. All right, so let's talk about the model minority myth. Uh, let me pose this question first. Does anyone know what the model minority myth is? Uh, feel free to type it in the chat, or if you want to say it out loud, what you think the model minority myth is. Okay, so seeing a few chats. Yes, yes, exactly. So you guys absolutely nailed it. Um, that's exactly what it is. And so this Reddit comment kind of really, really kind of addresses the model minority myth. Um, this was in response to something that Alice and I posted about in, in read in terms of forming a Asian diabetic group. And so this was the response. Um, and yet this isn't true. I can tell you my A1C has been far from perfect sometimes. And I can say growing up, you know, we've talked about, I talked about in the previous slide, how we value our academics a lot. We value our careers a lot. And so I saw the A1C as another grade. I essentially viewed it as a grade on my health. And so having, you know, growing up, having used to getting straight A's, I felt so disappointed whenever I would get a bad grade as in a bad A1C. And I would genuinely be so scared to go home to tell my, more specifically my dad that, yeah, my A1C was, you know, above a 7.5 or stuff like that. And so I just felt this extra pressure, you know, um, because there's just always this added pressure to, have good grades, be perfect in everything. And that extends to our A1C as well. And so the A1C was just another way of just kind of um, being part of the model minority myth and feeling like I have to be perfect in this regard as well. Um, Allison, do you have anything to add in terms of this for the model minority myth? Um, I agree with Cindy that, you know, that I viewed the A1C similarly as an achievement and slipping from this course results in a failure. I think um, my experience in sharing the A1C with my parents, um, I don't think my dad was maybe a sleepy dragon dad. He was, they were more passive, I think, in diabetes af after a while. So I was kind of like hoofing it alone, but I would start keeping it a secret. Like, I think my mom asked one day and I just said, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep that info to myself sort of as a shield. <laughs> um, so if they don't know like how I'm struggling with diabetes, then no one needs to harm me about it kind of thing. Um, so I can definitely, I can definitely feel the struggles to that. Um, I also want to bring out, we're additionally healthcare students. And so that opens up that whole worm, the can of worms about, you know, we're learning to take care of different health conditions, including type one potentially. 
um, versus struggling with our own type one. And, you know, that's like a talk for another day, but that also, you know, brings up a unique challenge for, for both of us as well. Um, and being Asian, just having the model minority myth dangled over me, it just becomes an expectation that diabetes is controlled, that I'm, that I'm good at it. And if I'm feeling vulnerable or if I've failed or if I've been like over 300 for 12 hours or something, you know, I feel incompetent. I don't feel like sharing it with others um, sometimes because I feel like it would, you know, damage my image or it would make me feel bad or something. So um, again, some very complex webs here, but I, I definitely think um, uh, that this is relevant. And my, and my grandparents too will sometimes ask me like, how's diabetes going? Well, I'm not going to tell them like the day to day, like what I've been doing with it, but you know, so there's that expectation to live up to. Okay, so uh, another challenge to Asian diabetics uh, that we thought was important is the stigmatization of mental health issues. A uh, statistic from 2018, Asians are 60% less likely to have received mental health treatment as compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, maybe some people type in the chat, what are some, I guess, barriers to achieving mental health care that you see for Asians, for for other groups, um, why would a statistic like this exist? Yeah, Quisha, stigma, seen as weak. It's one of the number one things on the list, yeah. Kat says, being told mental health is either a really bad thing for your image or that it's not real. Yeah. Being Told it's not real. That's something we'll get into. Yeah, Crystal says agrees. Reputation is big. Um, so this is a. Uh, oh, Quisha said, "Can cause shame on family." Yeah, this is a roadmap from the Asian Mental Health Collective, which is this amazing website I found that talks specifically about Asian mental health. And this is the roadmap of barriers. Um, to, to mental health care. So stigma, the taboo of discussing mental health. Witness this in my own family, and I'll have Cindy Way in it at the end too. Um, admitting that something is wrong is, is big, especially if it has to do with your head, right? You know, and parents, elders, other people, even cousins just might not know how to navigate that. It's not their fault. It's not anyone's fault. It's just, it's hard to talk about mental health from a baseline. But if an entire culture kind of values, you know, modesty and, you know, harmony, idealism, perfection, it just becomes hard to say, I've been feeling sad, you know, I've been struggling with these things. It's, it's hard to bring up and you don't want to be seen um, as weak or in need of help. You feel that pressure to deny or neglect symptoms when you're asked about them. And we, uh, part of this reason, I think at least in Chinese culture, there's that belief um, that we want to shield loved ones from our struggles sometimes. And I think that can be a universal thought. We don't want others to worry or go out of their way for us. We want to remain um, like independent if we can and, and not have others be bogged down by our problems. I think these are some of the major thoughts behind this. Um, two, intergenerational trauma. Um, this um, is just caused, this to me, like means different things. Um, and it's the idea um, that trauma experienced by one generation is transmitted down to the following generations. Um, there's a study that the children of Vietnamese refugees felt a burden to compensate for their parents' struggles. Um, and that rates of PTSD in their parents would predict rates of PTSD in them. Um, it also means to me there's the distrust between an Asian, Asian individual and the Western systems um, stemming from everything from discrimination to just hate crimes or um, uh, discrimination, hate crimes, and uh, oh, there is one more. Um, but um, these offenses can cause lasting effects on, on one's life and contribute to trauma being passed down and also lead to distrust of Western healthcare, Western systems. Um, the model minority myth we just talked about, um, having our symptoms dismissed as not real or being seen by um, 
the rest of the system as like Asians are not in need of mental health. Like they don't need their own funds. They don't need their own orgs, right? Like we do need support just like every other, every other group out there. Um, acculturation or pressure to succeed, we talked about acculturation differences. Um, so going back to those Asian family values, um, if we're taught to prioritize academic, professional and familial obligations, those might come first ahead of like the mental health struggle. Um, the thought that mental health is not important or not real, the language barriers, which we'll talk about, especially with our older people who might have type two, um, and not being able to access uh, material in about diabetes in their language is a big one, and then poverty. Um, there's also a scarcity of workforce that can relate to both our identities. I saw this article the other day. It was like this woman who was born in 1952 in Vietnam becoming like the first clinical psychologist in the US or the first Vietnamese psychologist in the US. And I'm like, that must have been like the 70s. I don't know. That's not, not too long ago. Um, but this is a list of great organizations online that do the work in, in, in sharing resources specifically to Asians. Um, and also uh, ways to search for ones in your region and the background behind them. So I um, thought these were great to look at. Um, Cindy, anything you wanna add on, oops, I'm going backwards. Anything you wanna add on this section? No, and I, I completely agree with what you're saying because I think it's important to have that conversation in the first place. There is such a stigma placed on mental health in the Asian community. It's seen as a sign of weakness and I know Asians also tend to be very private. Um, and so it's almost as if, okay, if there's a problem, one, keep it in the house, keep it in the family in the first place. Like, you know, don't bring it outside of the house. I know um, in my psychology class, like we had talked about that. We had talked about how Asians are one of the few or one of the lowest percentages to go seek uh, mental health in the first place because there is such a cultural emphasis placed on being strong, keeping in the family, being private and not sharing those kind of struggles, you know, with the outside world. And so I think it's important to have that dialogue. It's important to have that conversation and say it, it's okay, you know, to have these sh struggles. They aren't unique to any ethnicity. They aren't unique to any disease. You know, burnout is something I know I've struggled with personally, you know, having lived with type one for 18 years now. Um, there's been moments where I felt like I, you know, really wanted to give up in a sense. Um, and yet I, I take it very seriously. And I've been very fortunate to, you know, speak to counselors at school, also have friends, you know, just have a very supportive community for me to reach out and kind of share those struggles. So um, I think this infographic is great. I think it's also important to have those resources as well. So completely agree with everything you said, Allison. All right, so let's talk about advocating for Asian diabetics. So this is from 2013. This is the JDRF Children's Congress. This is in the Capitol Hill building uh, in, in DC. And so there were about 160 delegates from across the country, plus a few um, international delegate uh, delegates as well. And it was both such a fun, but also very interesting time. I was 17 year years old at the time. So I was about to enter senior year of high school. And I would say I was one of three Asians out of this 160 something delegates. And this is meant to represent the entire United States. And there are only two other people that looked like me that were talking three out of 160, that's less than 2% right there. And so, you know, this is meant to reflect the United States and yet I didn't feel very represented. Um, and so this is a struggle that, and Allison had talk, uh, touched on this prior as well, where I felt oftentimes I was like the only one in the room who looked like myself. And so, yes, we were all there because, you know, we have type one, we were representing, you know, the United States and representing our different states as well. And yet at the same time, I felt like this wasn't a true representation. Um, if you move on to the next slide. So this is the, um, the group or the chapter that Allison and I have volunteered at, at before. And as you can see here, there is no one that looks like me or Allison in this staff. Um, so it's been, it's hard, you know, they obviously do a great job, you know, representing us, but at the same time, we can't really talk to them about the struggles that we have. We don't, you know, really feel represented in terms of the leadership of our chapter. Next slide. 
Now, moving on to another organization, the American Diabetes Association. So, you know, there's been a better effort made in terms of trying to diversify the leadership here. But once again, there aren't any Asians on the staff. And so we want a seat at the table. We want to feel represented by the leadership of the organizations, by the leadership of the organizations that are meant to represent us. So. Um, so some of the needs we see for inclusive care, um, kind of overlapping with mental health care. Um, some barriers to diagnosis of diabetes in Asian Americans um, goes back kind of where we touch back on um, a distrust of Western medicine. Um, Eastern medicine is huge as we discussed and um, there's a lot of like interesting, um, interesting ways that you can combine both Eastern and Western medicine together. And as a future doc, I do re realize there's so many benefits of Eastern medicine and you can truly combine both for um, holistic care, um, but there are limitations to both sides. Um, Eastern medicine cannot monitor urine microalbumin or Eastern medicine cannot give you manufactured insulin or metformin, for example. So that huge rate of undiagnosed diabetes could be due to the fact that um, a lot of our you know, type two diabetic elders or adults like go to their um, Eastern medicine practitioners first, for example. So. Um, that could be reason for that statistic. Um, uh, other barriers to just care in general that we want to see addressed by large orgs is just um, the different ways outreach is conducted. Um, we want to see outreach being conducted in places where Asians gather, uh, you know, like health, um, health fairs or markets, churches, temples, things like that. That'd be great, culturally specific material. Um, and as we touched upon earlier, the dietary recommendations for um, Asian diabetic diets, um, that'd be great to have updated. So those resources are made more plentiful. Um, and this figure, um, in 2019, nearly three quarters of the US Asian population speaks English proficiently among the foreign born that, um, uh, that uh, percentage of less than proficient grows even larger. So um, important thing to remember too. Um, this is a great resource online for resources in our population, Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Uh, they have this dragon cook option. Um, I think you can build your own recipes. Um, they have some carb counting resources out there. Um, it's a little few and far between. Um, and there's ways to find um, Asian language speaking providers. So if you know personal contact, if you notice there's a large constituent of Asian diabetics in your area or, you know, meet one, um, this could be a great resource to offer. Okay, and some of these quotes um, that we, uh, questions that we post, what do you see moving forward for the Asian diabetic community? One person said, acceptance that medicine is necessary and life-sustaining, there should be no shame in having to seek medical care because it is essential to diabetes management. Um, another one, um, awareness drive across the country, the great couples with access to insulin for all. Yeah, and I wanna mention that uh, the insulin for all movement, it's an organization in all 50 states, all 50 states have a chapter. Um, we do need uh, more Asian representation in those areas too, right? Um, I see Asian type ones on social media, I see Asian type twos on social media, but. Um, in order to make sure that we're represented in these advocacy and legislation efforts, um, we do need to, you know, get invited or get involved to um, just more Asian faces that can relate to me. Um, this is from the website Two One International. It's so important to realize that, um, you know, diabetes exists everywhere. So. Um, some of the challenges faced by people in China, for example, there's discrimination against diabetes and higher education in the workplace. I'm sure something you all have struggled with as you um, decide to communicate your diabetes needs to your employers, and teachers and such. Um, challenges from type ones in Pakistan, 60% of our population lives under $2 a day and insulin is astronomical. So, you know, same thing that we're facing now with like, uninsured diabetics being unable to afford insulin. So 
we need to make sure that um, advocacy is inclusive and global. So, so Subtle and Asian Diabetics is a group that Allison and I, as well as two other Asian American type ones from Southern California formed. And so it's basically a, a way, a group for um, Asians with all kinds of diabetes who um, just kind of come together um, and just kind of share, you know, our struggles and encourage one another. We've posted um, kind of discussion questions talking about like, oh, what's been a high for you this week? What's been a low for you this week? Um, Allison and I are both uh, uh, studying to become providers. You know, what would you want a provider to know as a diabetic? And so it's been really cool to be a part of this and not only you know hear from Asians in the United States, but we've had people from Australia, people from India, you know, also join our group as well. And so not only getting to hear the struggles about Asians in the United States, but also getting to hear about unique challenges and struggles of Asians in other countries as well. And so this is our um, Instagram as well as our Facebook handles. So what's next for us? What can we do? We've talked about these challenges and these problems that we've had, what's next? So one thing that we can do is providing culturally specific educational material. Um, we had kind of talked about a little bit, we had talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but you know, there are people who don't uh, speak English. And so being able to provide resources for them in their native languages at health fairs, at markets, you know, so that, you know, people who are not proficient in English can understand how to better care for their diabetes. And then we'd also address, you know, um, having more Asian representation in organizational leadership, having a seat at the table and being able to advocate for our community. Yeah, the last three bullet points, dismantling of the model minority myth. Um, this starts with sharing our stories. It starts with talking to friends, family, and social media followers about the reality of being um, diabetic and showing, you know, Asians can be just as imperfect, right, as as um, um, as others in in managing A1C and having mental health struggles and the whole gamut of it, right? Um, that comment on Reddit kind of like stung a little bit, even though it was a joke, right? <laughs> um, and mental health care access for Asians with chronic illness, we talked about that's so important. And growing community spaces, um, we've seen some grassroots um, communities pop up for the LGBT diabetic community, the Black diabetic community. And so now we want to grow this Asian diabetic community for anyone who wants to join. Um, and it's here that we find connection. It's here that we can, you know, ask specific questions and, and just feel like seen. It's also nice for these communities to be included or honored by big organizations too, um, such as the ADA, JDRF, or Insulin for All, even beyond type one, um, would be great to, to, to have some coverage of like Asian diabetic needs, for example, or active efforts to include um, Asians in those efforts. So, yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the um, kind of wrap up to our presentation and what we had to share. Uh, we did want to open the floor to any of your thoughts, any of your questions um, and reactions to what you've seen. So uh, if you have anything to share, feel free to, to type in the chat. We're really open to any questions you have. Awesome. Well, thank y'all so much. I know y'all asked if there was any questions. Um, I'm so glad that everyone enjoyed it. And I know I did. I was really excited for this session. And um, I'm just, yeah, so excited for y'all's group and, you know, just the work that you guys are doing. So thank y'all so much for presenting today. Thank you for having us, Casey. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having us. Yep. All right, well, if there's no questions,